Um, so the purpose of our session today is to use some examples from the UBC farm and from the work that we do as academic researchers at the Center for Sustainable Food Systems to facilitate um, a discussion of examples of, of, of diversified marketing for farmers and um, particularly the marketing strategy of farm to institution, which is something that I will go into much more depth about a little bit later in the presentation. Um, we want to consider how these diversified strategies could be a part of meeting larger food systems goals, um, which we know a lot of people who work with farmers markets um, are very interested in. And we both want to take a sort of farmer's perspective, but we also want to then step up and look at the farmer's market perspective of how can markets uh, be part of these diversified strategies. So to start us off, why is it important to look at diversified marketing? Um, why should we look beyond one market channel, be it the farmer's market, be it selling to processors? Anyone, why is one channel um, potentially uh, not enough. Uh, so one reason is that the more marketing channels uh, that a farmer pursues, uh, the more opportunities there are for revenue. <laughs> and that's a good thing. <laughs> I know as being from a farm family, we're always looking for opportunities for revenue and for ensuring that we're going to have revenue. Um, and exploring diversified marketing channels also means that, that we're reaching different types of consumers. Um, so the more different ways that a farmer's produce or meat products or eggs is getting out there in the community, um, the more different types of community members are able to access it. And so more people are getting access to healthy and local food. Um, markets can also change. And diversification is a really good way to think about um, preparing for, um, managing, and kind of ensuring against uh, uh, catastrophic effects of market change. And we see one of the biggest examples of market change that's happened in BC and Ontario in recent years is the shutdown of a lot of the fruit and vegetable um, processing plants. And that has forced a change for lots of farmers who perhaps produce varieties that were geared toward a certain type of processing or freezing. Um, so Veronique is going to guide us through a discussion of how UBC Farm came to diversify its marketing channels and how it made some of those decisions along the way. Thanks, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. I've had the privilege for the past five years to be working at the UBC Farm in the field, but also with its students and researchers. And five years is not huge in the grand scheme of things, but it's been five years where it's been enough to kind of witness some of the changes that we've had in terms of how we grow and how we sell the food, but also enough to witness some of the shifts we've seen in who our clientele is and where is the demand coming from. But before I get into the really nitty gritty details of how we actually decide where the carrot goes, I want to really introduce you to what is the UBC farm, maybe refresh your memories. So the UBC farm is 60 acres that is nudged between the UBC Vancouver campus, Pacific Spirit Regional Park, and residential neighborhoods in Vancouver. The UBC farm, it grows food. It grows about 80,000 pounds of food per year. Um, it is a full-time operation. But one thing I want you to remember is that it's much more than just a place where we grow food. Being connected with the University of British Columbia, we have this mandate to also explore and model what it means to have a sustainable food system. And we do this by kind of merging together research, education, and community engagement related to food systems. So it kind of gives us the opportunity often to do like what Lisa and I are doing today, give you the research and analytical perspective, but also a real tangible on the ground examples of how those things are happening. So I put this slide there because I want to introduce you to those sales channel we have at the UBC Farm. We have four of them. Farmers Markets, a CSA, direct sales to restaurant, and direct sales to institution. The timeline here goes from 2000 to 2016. For the ones of you who know, there's been a farm at UBC for much longer than the year 2000. It's been there since 1950 when the university just established itself. 
you have to remember that then one family out of three was farming. So it was one of the founding faculties at UBC. It's only been since the 1970s that the UBC farm is currently at its own site. And it's really in 2000 that it's like the notion of local food and people wondering about local food became kind of sexy again. And this is when the UBC farm almost got revived. A group of students, faculty, staff, community members got together to start to maximize the use of the land again, grow more food. So along the way, we started with just a farmer's market on Saturdays. This is just a transformation from having gate sales. We had to sell the bit of food we were growing in the year 2000, and it became obvious that in our mandate to be this community engagement location, we could just start a Saturday farmer's market. Fast forward a few years later, some of the students that were growing that very food were also going to campus and were going to die. So two or three years after the UBC farm was revived, we got uh, to talking more with chefs at UBC, whether it's in restaurants or dining halls. And it's very much our students that made that push to have the food they were growing at the UBC farm also be sold and served in dining halls and institutions. CSA that happened around year 2006. That's when the farm was become was really pushing more its production. We had much more food. It was almost becoming too much to just sell to the institution or to our few chefs or to sell to our farmers market. Um, what is CSA? CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture Program. Some other people think of it as that kind of veggie box you get every week. You pay in advance. So that was becoming very popular, not only from a customer's perspective, because you get that box, that box every week, but there was also a trend from the farmer's perspective. For us, having you know, 20, 30 CSA share members meant we had a pre-sold set amount of food. So it's almost like it's a contracted amount of food that kind of gave us that financial stability throughout the growing season. And right between CSA and Wednesday Farmer's Market, so that decision to add another market, we just heard Michelle say often you add another farmer's market throughout the week, and it's not as popular or successful as the other one. For us, we had a very specific reason why we wanted to create a second farmer's market. It is that just before that, 2010, it's when um, the UBC farm got its land kind of preserved for academic purposes. So before that, there was a Save the Farm campaign. It wasn't sure the UBC farm was going to keep its location and mandate uh, in Vancouver. And in 2010, that's when we got kind of like the OK stamp from UBC to remain there. And that almost opened the floodgate to being now we can expand. Now we can grow more food, but now we can also reach more people. So again, thinking back to that education and community outreach mandate, we decided to bring the food even more at the heart of campus. So in addition to having a Saturday farmer's market where we had our own produce, but also other vendors and other farmers, some of us coming from our own farmer training <coughs> program, we decided to go to campus one day a week to kind of meet the customer, meet the students and the faculty and staff where they were. In 2013, 2014, we saw a pretty significant expansion of how much we were selling to restaurants and to institutions. Restaurants that came from years and years of relationship building and kind of building that trust that we were growing a high quality product. The institutional sales came from just a number of different things happening at the same time. We had new facilities on campus. UBC had a big sustainability mandate to procure food from the local and regional um, kind of landscape. And we also, in our case, wanted to have more conversations with those chefs because we were willing to adapt a bit our growing techniques or our crops to what they needed. So growing beets and carrots and potatoes the way we do today, we didn't do that in 2010. It is through conversations with chefs that serve thousands and thousands of students that we kind of adapted our crop production to meeting a bit that demand from UBC. And then recently, we started a Tuesday farmer's market. Again, seems kind of ridiculous, add another one. But this was almost like an optimization of our strategy. We were already doing a CSA pickup on Saturdays and Tuesdays. We had 50 to 60 families coming on a Tuesday afternoon. We had about 60 parents coming to pick up their kids at the end of the day from a kids program that we have on site. So it made sense for us to be like, let's trial this out. Let's see if it makes sense for us to bring just a tiny bit more capacity, a tiny bit more infrastructure, and have a mini kind of farmer's market on Tuesday at the same time as all those other activities are going on. 
So this is how it came to be. So today, at the edge of this new growing season, as all my staff is getting excited over seed catalogs and getting the land ready, we have three farmers markets, uh, a CSA share program of about 110 families. We serve about 40 different restaurants in one major institution that is UBC. This is what it looks like in terms of how much is sold or how much has been sold since 2011 all the way to 2015. This is our revenue data. At the very top, this is our farmer's markets data. It has remained stable over the years, um, even a slight decrease in the past two years. Our restaurants and institutional sales have had a pretty significant increase and a very sharp one uh, just in the recent past two years. Our CSA has expanded significantly between 2013 and 2014, where we had a good season and decided to just expand our CSA program of about 50 members. And in miscellaneous is all those sales that you don't know where to categorize them. Staff sales, one-off sales, and those have remained relatively stable over time. What this kind of data shows us is, yes, that kind of those kind of trends over time. But when my team and I look at those data, we're also able to identify some of the synergies that we know have happened or were born out of having that diversified kind of marketing strategy, but also some of the tensions. And I thought this is the kind of stuff I could share with you so that, A, if it's not working, just maybe try to not do it. And if it's working well, just it's something that we'd like to share with everyone. So I would say that one of the best benefit of having this diversified marketing strategy is that we pretty much sell everything we grow. What isn't sold through a preset agreement with restaurants, institutions, or through our CSA program is sold at farmer's market. So we have this balance. Again, every farm is unique, and I'd love to hear more about every one of your farm, but in our case, we also have this niche market and population, 75,000 people residing and or working on an isolated UBC peninsula. So that has been definitely a benefit of being located there. One other synergies we've been observing is some, it was one that I think a lot of you have maybe picked up is our Saturday farmers, our mark, farmers market actually have become CSA pickup times. You know, why? doing it at different times, it just made a lot of sense. It also meant that some of our customers that are going to pick up their CSA shares would also top up their CSA with whatever we had available that they get the farmer's market. Another synergy, and I touched on this a little bit, is just adjusting your crops. We've been able to grow more of those kind of cold storage crops like beets, carrots, and potatoes because we know we can sell those largely to institution and to farmer's market but then we've also been able to tailor some of our production to be like, those cute cash crop cherry tomatoes, they're not for the institution, but we have them for the farmer's market. So our synergies are felt even at the field level. There's been some tensions though, and this graph shows a little bit of that. We have three farmer's market. And sometimes we think that we're starting to kind of, eat, like that competition within our own farmer's markets is happening. So maybe that's what has led to that kind of leveling. There's competition elsewhere in Vancouver for sure. There's so many more farmer's market now than there used to be. But again, that testing and trialing that Tuesday farmer's market is maybe something that in four or five years from now, we're gonna look at and say, hmm, maybe that was not the best of investment. But just like Michelle was saying, sometimes you do have to have that patience and really try to push that idea and see after a few years if it's been definitely a failure or not. Another tension we have is by expanding our CSA program, we definitely do think that that has kind of eaten a bit of our um, farmer's market. So maybe some of those members from our CSA program were farmer's market customers before, and now they don't come to the farmer's market maybe because there's no obvious need to go. And finally, it's not a tension or a synergy, but something that we're very much on the lookout at the farm is that increase in restaurant and institutional sales, especially as we're about to step into a new growing season. It's something that we're just aware, and given that, like most of you, our capacity for expanding our production in terms of land expansion is not, like it's decreasing. We're just running out of land to grow more food, and we keep having an increased demand. So it leads us to always be like, 
Yeah, where will the carrot go? You know, how will we actually decide which channel it goes to? Um, and that increase, it also comes with a reflection on, I'm showing you revenue here. Like, there's also profit data. And looking into, for example, last year we had a great early crop of radishes. We were May 2015, we had like a radish galore. And at this point, farmer's market had not started. Our CSA members, they like radish, but I mean, there's so much I can put in that box. So instead of bunching them, which is what we've always done, which is a bit labor intensive, we spoke with a few chefs, we decided to sell them by the pound in a tote. Can you imagine? So much more easier for my staff. Um, and then we kept a similar, similar pricing because chefs actually valued having the greens from the radishes to cook with. Um, and it worked. And it's actually something we continued all throughout the season to do. We bunched a few uh, radishes, but we also sold a lot, a lot of them by pound. So as we're moving forward, I feel like we're having some pretty important decision to make as to do we prioritize one channel over the other, um, especially if there's an impact on how we operate, and talking specifically about labor here, how we operate our farming, um, our farming kind of landscape. So before last year, we did not even track what was a restaurant sale and an institutional sale. For us, it was just like wholesale, all in the same package. But that's actually one of the interesting things about working with researchers like Lisa and being very connected to that sustainable food system movement is that we were aware that this institutional procurement demand or movement was coming. So we decided to start tracking what we sold specifically to the institution, so a diversity of UBC outlets, and what was the rest. So farmers, again, this is sales, data, revenue. Farmers market remain our greatest revenue generator, followed by CSA, followed by restaurants, and then institution. So of course, and Lisa will expand a bit on this right now, is just about forecasting what this pie chart would look like in future years, and what are we willing to decrease and increase in terms of proportion. This is one case study. This is just a UBC farm with our own unique traits. So I'd love to hear a little bit about you, and I'm also at the same time gonna to try to wake you up a little bit. Um, I would like for you if you have been involved in any sort of sales through farmers markets, to stand up. All of you, really. <laughs> for food or for processed food? Doesn't have to be like... But if it's, we, we sell soul. That That's works, it. totally. <laughs> Thank you. We don't recommend you either. Okay, <laughs> then I want you to sit down. This is like aerobics farming. If you've been involved in selling or in relationship with a CSA program, can you please stand up? Thank you, Bruce. Perfect, thanks. If any of you has been selling direct or in relationship with restaurants. Awesome, thank you. And lastly, if you've been involved selling directly or through a wholesale to institutions, so hospitals, schools, universities, Jails. That's what we thought. <laughs> that worked. Nursing home, totally. So we kind of thought maybe there was this bit of a gap in terms of like who sells to institutions and what does that mean. So I'm going to pass it back to Lisa and she's going to give you a bit of an introduction of what that is. So maybe a lot of you haven't been involved in selling to institutions, although we're very excited that um, someone has been selling to nursing homes. Um, but how many of you have a least heard of, we'll say, maybe the most common farm to institution program, which is farm to school. Many of you have heard of it. Okay. Um, so for those of you who have, or maybe that term connotes something in your mind, what would you think of as being really key parts of, of a program that called itself farm to school or farm to institution? So children get to eat new foods, perhaps? Educating. Educating um, the consumers, either the children or the other people involved in the institution. Mm -hmm. Safety. People in institutions is the risk that comes with that. Yes, spoken by our, our food safety expert that 
certainly whenever you're going to uh, into an outlet that's going to be mass producing food for a, a, consumed by a lot of people, safety is very important. Packaging. Packaging, how's it gonna get there, right? It's very operationally, how you can get it to that institution, transportation, the packaging, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess what comes to mind is like probably large volume and, and low price. Okay, so that the institutions may have um, these very specific demands, which are, um, they need a whole lot of it, um, often they'll need a consistent supply, and they'll want a low price. Um, so I'm really excited to hear all of those things, because um, you touched on kind of a couple of different ways of approaching the foreign institution discussion, and I want us to do both of those today. And one is to look at it, um, what are the operational challenges um, and operational needs, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a couple of our examples, um, and we hope to talk about more through that in the workshopping time. And then another of them is what are the sort of broader values um, and ideas associated with farm to institution? Um, and I, so I just want to give a few concrete examples, and so the, the most direct example is if you had a cafeteria that is serving food that was produced on a local farm. Okay, that's our, our, uh, a very baseline example. Um, other examples of programs that are coming under the umbrella of farm to institution and farm to school as it's practiced and discussed here in BC um, by groups like food policy councils, by um, public health associations, um, by Ministry of Health uh, and Health Authorities. Um, having uh, school gardens on school property is also a type of farm institution program. Having students involved in community garden programs. Um, having farmers come into schools um, to do educational program with students. Um, and on the other hand, having students go out to the farms for educational opportunities. Uh, and also, uh, having students involved maybe through culinary programs in Canada, processing of food um, as part of their curriculum. Um, and so, again, this is stepping back to that sort of broader idea of what are the kind of theoretical components of of farm to institution and farm to school programs. Uh, and through our reviews of a lot of studies, both uh, you know, from across North America, from Canada and the US, um, we see that these are four key components. And not all programs that get classified as farm to institution have these four components. Um, but we'll say they really, they have at least one, usually at least two involved. Um, so those are local food procurement, so supporting the local farmers by buying these large quantities that institutions need um, from local farmers who um, need to sell their products. Um, supporting healthy eating, so getting more um, fresh, nutritious food into the hands of people who are eating uh, at institutional cafeterias, which are often people who don't have access to healthy food elsewhere. Um, so for example, students or people um, in correctional facilities or perhaps in hospitals or long-term care facilities. Um, community connectedness, so really bringing together um, different actors in the community, broadening that conversation, um, you know, thinking not about the institution or the farm as isolated, but as working together and as part of the larger community. And then food literacy and education, helping people to learn more about where their food comes from, um, how it's prepared, what goes into growing it, and all steps of the food system. And so, and, and you know, farm to institution programs now have been going in Canada you know, for at least a decade, some of them longer, uh, but in the US, and this is in large part because the US does have a national school food program that's been in existence for many decades, uh, there's a lot of research on farm to institution and farm to school there. And so, um, you know, from the farmer's perspective, they see that there are lots of opportunities for farmers when it comes to being involved in farms and institution. And so that diversified marketing strategy, um, like Veronique was talking about, is the number one, but it can be help you an insulator if another marketing strategy is eliminated or no longer viable. Um, so some farmers have also found that farm to institution can be a way to sell seconds so produce that isn't pretty enough 
for um, the farmer's market or the grocery store. If it's going to be made into a tomato stew at a school that's going to feed 500 students, then the tomato doesn't have to be as beautiful um, and picture perfect. Uh, and it also can provide that planned consistent market. Um, so if you have a contract with a large institution or a small institution. So those are economic benefits and then there are also social benefits um, that can have economic implications as well. And so those include um, building those stronger relationships with the community. So you know, if a, a, a farmer is selling to a school or an institution, um, that can be a way that they maybe can get to know the parents or get to know the families of the people in that institution and then those uh, parents and families may come shop for at the farmer's market. Um, it's also just a great way to promote education about the food systems and often um, the more people know, the more they want to buy locally and buy from farmers at their local farmer's market or at their farm gate. Um, and then it's, of course, increasing access to healthy food for people. So we want to talk through a couple of examples um, from the UBC farm and then from some research that we're doing at the Center for Sustainable Food Systems. And um, we want to talk about both our successes and some challenges that, we're had, that, that both of these situations are having. Um, so this is just the sales data from the last couple of years of how much, what percentage of um, the UBC, UBC farm retail revenue came from sales to UBC food services or food outlets that serve students and faculty and staff. So this is that population of uh, people that are milling around QBC every day and hungry and needing to eat, all right? and all those little campus outlets that serve food. Um, and so I do want to note here, just uh, even though QBC farm is a 60 acre farm, it's only what, 10 acres of it are actually um, produced food, the rest is forest and um, biodiversity reserve. Um, so if our numbers were looking a little small for 60 acres, that's, that's why it's really we're looking at 10 acres. Um, and so some successes uh, that have come out of UBC's sale, or the UBC farm sales to the UBC food outlets um, are that, you know, the food is there. The food is now incorporated in the ca campus restaurants. The, the students, faculty, and staff are eating locally. UBC runs its own food service. This is key. It does not work through a food service contractor. So UBC is able to make the decision to have the farm van drive up or drive down to the farm and load its van up directly with those vegetables and to purchase them directly from the farm. And UBC has made that decision to prioritize that purchasing. Um, So um, the challenge that the UBC farm has faced in this marketing channel is with selling to the UBC hospital. Um, so the UBC hospital is a separate um, food system, we would say, than um, the, the food that serves the faculty, staff, and students. Um, but it seemed so easy because it's such a short walk from the farm to the hospital. And why can't um, you know, that carrot grown on the farm be put on a plate um, that is taken to a patient in a room at the UBC hospital. And, and so the farm said, we want to do this. We want to serve the hospital. We want to be involved with beyond um, just the student, faculty, and staff population at UBC. Well, it's definitely not so simple. Um, the UBC hospital um, works with a food service contractor, so it doesn't run its own food service. That food service contractor has to source from a certified wholesaler. Um, and you know, that certified wholesaler in turn has to make sure that all of its, thank you, all of its producers are meeting those food safety regulations and that it can account for um, food safety and recall for the good agricultural practices, um, for the HACCP, for all of those certifications. Um, and so you know, UBC Farm understood that and they said, well, you know, we'll do that. We will get those certifications. We'll work with the wholesaler. Um, we'll go. We'll join a cooperative if we have to to make this happen, so that we can get this food into the hospital. Um, and, and the farm is still considering pursuing this. However, the issue that we have is because of the way the wholesale distributor system works for the 
hospitals, um, food service contracts wholesaler, uh, is that the food will then have to travel many kilometers, all the way from Vancouver to at least Richmond, possibly farther, um, to go through the distribution warehouse and to get in the system and, and get that stamp of approval before it comes back to the hospital. So we no longer have that food coming from a 10, 15 minute walk away. Um, we now have food, we're now back to that long chain. And so it's something that UBC Farm is deciding is how to manage this and whether to keep pursuing this outlet because it then becomes a question of does this fit within the sustainability mandate on the farm. Um, however, a success actually was getting all of these people at the table. So we've had several conversations where the farmers at UBC are sitting down with the food service contractors, these big businesses, and with the wholesalers, also these big businesses, big businesses, and with experts in certification to kind of at least start to talk through these problems and what might happen. So that is a success that's coming out of that. Um, so our second case study um, is a program that's called the Farm to School BC Regional Hubs. Um, and so, this is an effort at organizing farm to school efforts, um, both within individual schools and then at the regional level. Recognizing that if we just look provincially, it can be a little too big. And it's often hard because BC is such a large province and such a diverse province. Um, schools in different regions have different needs. And, and so if we bring it to the regional level, then um, it's big enough that there's the possibility for networking and support, but also small enough to work within the local context. Um, <coughs> so, in 2014, the PHABC, which is the Public Health Association of British Columbia, um, which had long been involved in various ways in um, farm to school efforts uh, that had started here and there, kind of on their own throughout the province, um, it created the regional hubs uh, to meet several needs, um, both to just get more farm to school programs going, to get more schools involved, um, to provide support for um, both groups and individuals who are already working on farm to school. So in many cases, um, those passionate people, maybe they're nurses in the school, maybe they're individual teachers, um, were trying to bring food literacy education, trying to get local food into schools, but it was all completely on top of their already incredibly strenuous jobs. And so the regional hubs were created to help support them and also to help them keep programs going. Um, so that you know, if a particular teacher left a school or if someone got a new assignment, um, that there was some sort of, kind of guidance to help keep that program going. Um, and the hubs were also created to provide coordination coordination and develop, develop networks so that every school that wanted to do a farm to school program wouldn't necessarily just have to start from scratch on their own, um, but they could get connected and linked up with other schools who were trying to do similar things and perhaps share resources and learn from each other. So um, successes with the regional hubs um, is that over the past couple of years, there has been an increase in farm to school programs through this. Um, the regional hub programs have given out numerous grants to individual schools, and particularly vulnerable schools that didn't have the resources to start their own farm to school programs before. Um, and so that's been fantastic. Um, <coughs> a lot of those programs are in the form of school gardens or getting students involved in community gardens in neighborhoods. Um, they have We've also really done a great job of helping to promote the sustainability of farm to school programs. So a common issue with school gardens is that school's out for the summer, uh, that's the best time for the garden, what is going to happen to it? Um, so the regional hubs have helped to get local urban farmers connected with school gardens, both to help bring education into the schools and to help keep those gardens going over the summers. Um, and some urban farmers are you know, even finding ways to kind of bring that into their, uh, their business operation as well. Um, they've also been successful in building this network, um, and providing the support to the public health officials, to the teachers, um, to the food system activists. Um, that's all been a great success. Um, 
building excitement. <laughs> you know, some of you may have seen the Vancouver School of Food kind of little video that just came out in the last month or so. Uh, it's gotten a lot of press. It's been really great. Um, and there's also been some successes uh, driven by the hubs in terms of getting farm to school on the policy agenda of cities. Right? Some challenges um, with the regional hubs. So, <laughs> a lot of the farm to school programs that have been started, um, some of you might ask, is it really farm to school um, in terms of uh, is the food that local or regional farmers producing actually getting into schools? And in some isolated cases, yes it is. And some individual schools, because of the infrastructure they have, because they have the cafeteria site, um, because they have that kind of, a, because they don't have contracts with a large food um, service kind of business, um, in some cases, yes. But most of the farm to school programs um, that are really active and going and keep going year after year are the school garden focused programs and are the food literacy um, and education program, which is great. <laughs> but also, um, it speaks to the fact that there's an opportunity here <laughs> for farmers, both urban and I think especially farmers outside of the city, um, to potentially become more involved in supplying schools and with it other institutions. So I do want us to, to talk a little bit more about that, because I think that's an opportunity that's not realized. That's where the, the farm to school dream isn't fully realized yet, and, and that's where it can be, and potentially help the farmers as well. Um, so yeah, it's really, the, the biggest challenge there has been bringing the farm more in. So, yeah, I do, I, I will say that I think that, that farm institution is just a really emerging huge opportunities for, opportunity for farmers, um, particularly small and medium scale farmers who may be looking to diversify. Um, you know, I would sort of recommend at the very basic level, um, if you're not in one of those regions of Vancouver, Kamloops, or the capital area around Victoria, and you're interested in farm, farm institution, look up Farm to School BC, um, you know, even start kind of talking with the institutions in your area. If you're in one of those regions and you'd like to be more involved in the regional hubs, uh, let me know. I can kind of help with those connections. I know that you know there's room in those hubs for more involvement from farmers. Um, and then we talked a little bit kind of unoptimistically about some of these very particular challenges. Um, with distribution, with certifications, um, that we're really holding back that farm to hospital component of farm institution. And we would say that, you know, UBC Farm is kind of in a weird situation there with just really having wanted to do that short walk to the hospital. But I think it more generally, uh, definitely looking into co-ops is a way to go around that. Co-ops that are already know how to get their farmers certified. If you, could join up with one of them, they could help you go through those certification processes and get linked in with the right wholesalers who do provide to food service contractors. Um, the other option, and this is one thing that UBC Farm is now considering because we still want to be involved with the hospital in some way, is providing something else for them. And so we're now looking at um, providing, you know, can we provide small potted plants? Um, to the hospital. Uh, the hospital unit we're working with has a small budget for a welcome plant for each visitor. The question is, you know, could those be grown on the farm? And could that be a way that we can at least open the door to that connection and show the possibilities so that hopefully down the line uh, we can get the, the fruits and vegetables and eggs and other products into the hospital. Okay, <laughs> so um, that is the kind of core of our presentation. Um, this is good, we're about halfway through our time, I believe. Um, and so we would like to take a break uh, a few minutes just to see if you have any questions, any clarification. I know we may have kind of covered a lot and gone through some really specific things there. So any any clarification questions or anything that you want before we move on? Um, you, you've got your farmer's market and you've got your institution, your wholesale. So what kind of discount do you have to give your wholesalers to be competitive? Like, did you, it was it like a specific example, like the one, the radish I gave, or? Or whatever, because you, you've got your. Yeah, like we are, like we charge, like the premium at the farmer's market, and then CSAs, I don't have the exact numbers in terms of discount, but 
we charge a tiny bit less. <coughs> yeah, I don't have my numbers on top of my head. Yeah, like because the CSA is like a pre-sold set, so we're able to just have that stability and just know that it's coming, so we're able to charge a tiny bit more. And it's the same thing with the wholesale. Um, sometimes though we are playing, you know, in the radish example, um, we knew we were selling the bunch like at a certain amount of money, and like five bucks a bunch of radish, or three or five dollar. And then when we try to assess how much we were gonna charge per pound to do that kind of just bite tote for you know, wholesale, um, we had conversations with the chef and just assessed that when you're bunching, you're actually um, destroying the greens a little bit of the radish, and when you're not bunching them, they can actually use the greens. So there we actually tested to keep still a pretty good high price to wholesale, just kind of like, um, kind of, arg not arguing, but kind of saying, you know, you're getting a high quality product, like you're getting the whole product. So you got negotiated very successfully because it worked out. So yeah, so I would say it's like farmer's market, CSA, and then our wholesale. I don't remember the exact percentage, though. I can get it because I have my data on my computer, but a bit later. Just curious to see, to see how feasible it is for a small farmer to, to discount, because you know, we're working on pretty small margins as it is. Yeah, and I think that goes like the, what, what's your name? Mike. So Mike said, you know, it's like we're working at pretty small margins and small to medium scale farms. And I think those are the kind of decisions sometimes that are hard to make. You know, you want to diversify, but there's going to be some consequences to that. And is maybe one of the answers to keep that diversification. So you are kind of not getting as much of a margin when you do wholesale, but you have that preset stable income, you know, you have almost like a contract with each of the wholesaler and direct restaurant sales that allows you to know ahead of time that you're not going to just go to the farmer's market maybe and not sell half of your food. So it's, it's kind of playing that balance. Good question though. And, and this is talking a little bit as a pie in the sky researcher here. I'll, I'll definitely put that hat on for a moment. Um, in some other countries, um, places like Brazil and in some places in the US, um, there are policies in place for institutional procurement that allow institutions um, to pay a little more if, say, they're buying locally um, than if they're uh, going through a large, maybe multinational distributor. So while that's you know, not necessarily on the ground here yet. Um, for those of you who work in food systems policy and that sort of, you know, have that interest as well, it's so it's kind of on one of those goals down the line to think about could something like that work in BC where institutional budgets have the ability to privilege sourcing locally. So this is where we should be leaning on the politicians. Yeah. Well, yes. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious. So your staff salaries paid out of your profits of already we knew we were going to have that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Robert's question was, you know, where is the money coming from to pay our staff? We, we're called the UBC farm and it kind of implies that we are like, fully subsidized, which is not the case. So about, um, I want to say, five to eight percent of our budget does come from a subsidy from UBC. Um, but that is to account for the fact that we don't only just grow food like we do. Um, educational programming of the Wazoo. Like we have kids program with environmental education, we have indigenous health initiatives, um, we have a lot of research programs on site that require you know coordination and management. So that most of our farming operation themselves, if you actually do the, the budget calculation at the end of the year, are breaking even or generating a small profit. So all of our staff, like our field staff, seasonal staff, is being paid by our sales, our produce sales. Yeah, we're totally, yeah, like we, the whole idea with the UBC farm is we try to run just the same way as any other farm. Like we're bottom line in some way because if we're not running bottom line like another farm, then there's anything we test, anything we do differently is not applicable. Um, it does sometimes give us the opportunity to explore something new and be innovative, like the farm to institution. You know, maybe some, uh, some other farm that's very bottom line would not have been able to take that leap, but we had the support of students, educators, researchers to try to do it. Yeah, we always like to joke that like, yeah, we're telling you if something we do works, and we're also gonna tell you if we screw up big time, because it's kind of our role also as an education kind of center. So yeah, good question though. 
Yeah, and the, the biggest difference, I think, and in, in why that, that subsidy sort of matters, you know, I can on any given day say, I'm gonna, you know, I'll, I'll contact Mary Deek and say, I wanna bring a, a class of 30 students or, or three of my classes of 30 students out for two or three days this week. Um, and I, you know, we're just not, Veronique's not gonna let 30 students run free on a farm that's growing vegetables that need to be nice and look good and ready to go to our customers. And so then the field staff really does have to stop farming, they have to stop weeding, um, stop harvesting, stop what they're doing to take care of my class that's coming out there. So that's why, you know, the farm provides providing a service to the university as well. Um, and so that's why that subsidy kind of, you know, yes, it's a difference, and yes, it's a unique situation, but it's also accounting for um, for that sort of thing. Yes, so I'm gonna repeat the question for the gentleman at the back. So we spoke a lot about how to access institutional procurement. You do have to go through those regulations, whether those are GAP regulation or HACCP certified for food safety. Um, and the question from Candice was, you know, how can we just get rid of this block? It's a pretty significant block for most small to medium scale farm to have the funds to go through that process of getting uh, food safety certified at that level of complexity. Um, there, this is where we were happy when we started this project to have everyone at the same table. So we had the wholesalers, we had the food service kind of providers, and we had the hospital. Um, and through conversations with them, I mean, we saw it as a very good step that we were, we were all sitting at the same table and we were able to tell them, this is a huge barrier for us. I mean, we probably already follow a lot of the guidelines, but we haven't gone through the actual like, paying for the certification and keeping track of everything to the same level as another one. How we remove this gap is one way to solve that or to kind of address, it's one option. We're trying to see, removing the, the barrier may not be the way to go, like to remove it entirely. I think it's about having conversations with the wholesalers about what are our options in terms of maybe our farm not carrying the whole responsibility of the fees and of going through the process. And this is where we've been having conversations with co-ops, with uh, food aggregators, food hubs that may actually know already how all of this is working and could almost like strike a deal or be this kind of intermediate between the two. So does that answer a little bit of question? Like I hesitate to be like, I'm not sure we can actually remove that gap because speaking with the hospital, it was unbelievable all the food safety guidelines we had to meet. Like we could not sell apples because apples could be dangerous weapons. You know, like, so like we have to go through all of this. So removing the food safety is a, that would be a huge kind of mountain to climb. And I think we're just trying to see how we can go around it. Are you organic? Yeah, we're gonna, we're transitional right now, organic, and we're gonna get our full certification in May. Um, so yeah, again, that was one of those conversations we were having with our, you know, customers. Like, you know, do, when do we make that decision? And uh, for us, it became clear that um, not only our customers, but our education mandate. We do have like a farmer training program that trains like uh, a few dozen farmers. We, like, we wanted to take that step. We also have a sustainability mandate, which is environmental uh, sustainability. So we decided to go for that. Good question, though. Oh, uh, just one more thing. I would point out that not all institutions have quite the same level of barrier that the hospital did. So, you know, again, because an institution like UBC manages its own food service, um, we had an in because then there wasn't that going through quite so many intermediaries. So part of it is researching the different institutions that are available to you in your market area and you know asking what are their requirements because it may not always, it may not always be that onerous. The door may be more open in some cases. It yeah. sounds to me like the, the hospitals are the, are the ones who have the, the largest amount of regulations, like the whole apple can become wet. Uh, kind of anecdotally, that's what we've seen. Yeah, is, is we've seen um, more kind of across the board barriers. Um, so Rick had a good point. It was like you know the hospital seems to be the place where there's the most amount of barriers, but we also felt like the hospital was where we were the most compelled to go because it seemed like this is the people and the population that may 
gain the most from having access to really healthy foods. Um, we received uh, letters and emails from people after learning about a project of people being in the hospital and eating that, you know, very infamous hospital food. Um, yeah, halfway through the project, I broke my leg and I ended up in the hospital and I was like, I'm getting data right now about how to make this better. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not an easy uphill kind of uh, journey, but I think it's one that, again, the UBC Farm being this place where we try to innovate and we have the support, educational and research to do it, that we were kind of willing to undertake. So, yeah, let's do one more question now. Yeah. Have you considered inviting the companies that are the wholesalers to have a small annex on the farm itself so the food wouldn't need to be shipped? They already have all the information. They can just have their own building and save all that step. So her question was in inviting the um, distributors or the wholesalers to perhaps set up a small shop on the farm. Um, things like that have been part of our conversations. And I think that there are, that is a potential avenue that could work in some situations. You know, it's something, uh, you know, if you're working on pursuing this with an institution in your area, it might be something you want to bring up in the conversation. Um, in our particular case, because of the, the structure of their warehousing and the structure of their inventory system and, and the way that they processed all that, um, that wasn't an option that the particular kind of company was able to entertain, but it, it is a, a potential solution that's out there in different situations. You know, we talk a lot about local food, and I think here we're all passionate about bringing it to everybody's kind of kitchens. It, and farm to institution is just one way to do that. Like, local food seems to be on everyone's mind, yet it's not on everyone's menu. And just institutions have this massive capacity to make this happen. Um, and I think that farmers markets have had a very innovative and leadership role in making local food more a central theme. So it's just about opening that conversation into the future. What's the role, what's the connection between farmers market, farmers, and institutions? So yeah, that was my Thank you all. Yay.